Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to this today webinar that we will be having today and tomorrow. My name is Laura Fernandez. I am program coordinator at Media Lab Matadero. I will speak in Spanish just for one moment to welcome everyone also in, in Spanish. Eh, bienvenidas todas y todos a este seminario online de presentación de proyectos del Lab 1 Medios Sintientes. Eh, vamos a desarrollar este seminario principalmente en inglés, ya que algunos de los ponentes y de los proyectos eh, que se presentan no hablan en castellano. Entonces va a ser la mejor manera de podernos entender todos, pero bueno, esperamos que esto no sea un inconveniente y que, y que todos lo podamos seguir. Aún así, quizá algunos de los proyectos que se van a presentar sí que hagan su, su presentación en castellano, si sus promotores se sienten así más cómodos. Y en cualquier caso, para todas las personas que lo estéis siguiendo online, si queréis enviar vuestras preguntas, podéis hacerlo a través del chat eh, también en castellano. Eh, I will switch to English again. Eh, as, as you already know, eh, the main purpose of this webinar is to present the eight projects that have been selected through an open international call and which will be developed collaboratively in a prototyping workshop under the topic of medios sintientes, sentient media. Eh, this workshop will be held at Media Lab Matadero eh, in Madrid from the 21st of April to the 4th of May this year and will be conducted by three mentors, which are eh, Abelardo Gil Cournier, Nerea Calvillo and the Quadrature Collective. The idea of presenting the project in this webinar is that anyone interested in taking part in the workshop can know more about those projects so that they can apply to the open call for collaborators, which is open now and which will be open until the, the 3rd of April. So if you want to be part of the team that will develop any of these eight projects uh, that will be presented today and tomorrow, you can apply to this open call. Uh, it is interesting to, to remind that Media Lab will cover travel and accommodation expenses for eight projects coming from outside Madrid. So today we will have the presentation of four projects and after each of these presentations, there will be some time for questions or comments. So if you are following the webinar and would like to ask something, please use the YouTube chat to send your questions and the team will collect the questions and will help them to the, to the speakers. In addition to these four projects, we have the pleasure uh, of having three great invited speakers with us today. Uh, whose work deal with issues uh, which are related to the topic of medios sintientes. And we're going to present the, the first of these invited speakers, Yusi Parika. Yusi uh, is professor in digital aesthetics and culture at the Aarhus University. And he's also a visiting professor at the Academy of Performing Arts in Prague. His work addresses a wide range of topics that contribute to a critical understanding of network culture aesthetics and media archaeology in contemporary society, as well as the politics and history of new media, cultural analysis of new materialism and media theory. So Yusi, thank you very much for joining us. I just want to say first, thank you. Um, thank you. I'm going to put on a, um, a note to myself about time. So you uh, make sure that we're on schedule. Um, uh, I, I really want to kind of start with, with a thank you. It's, it's, I realized that, um, you know, obviously we've been, so many of us have been, have been, have been able to be in dialogue with you, with you, Laura, uh, with Eduardo, with Tiga, with Luisa, and, and I'm super keen to hear um, the projects today. Um, this will be a really delightful event, I know already. Um, I want to although start with with a note that you know it is at the back of our brain anyway and it's difficult to continue business as usual or even business comma as usual in the context of um, the war in Ukraine and uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and um, <clears throat> I feel that it's good to um, in this context also remember how grateful uh, we need to be um, to be able to discuss um, amongst each other in this context, but also sending our solidarity to uh, Ukrainian um, um, people and Ukraine, but also Russian resistance in this context as well. Um, I'll talk about something related to our topic though. Um, I'll talk about, um, I'll offer this short talk 
as a little mediation on questions of sense and sensing in ways that refers to some of the earlier work that I've been doing, but also some of the things that I hope will resonate across the projects that we will listen to today, which, which really sound amazing, to be honest, um, based on all of the titles. And I wish I could have been more involved already, already earlier with the work, but glad I'm now. Um, I hope that my talk, um, because I'm pulling material from earlier work of mine, won't be too repetitious, but I thought that it could be acting as a sort of a showcasing of um, questions of non-human sensing, uh, as well as linked to critical post-humanities, um, and as such makes sense uh, for the ways in which we think of theory and practice today and tomorrow. Um, like in many other contexts, I feel this connection between media theory, cultural history, and current design and artistic practices, um, they really become a fruitful way of approaching the issues. Um, it has for sure also influenced the other way around of how we discuss media studies and media theory in proximity with experimental practices and how the theoretical topics can have a role to play in educational and practice-based situations as well. I'm currently, I mean, often I, I sort of relate to media studies, but at the moment I work in, in the Department of Digital Design and Information Studies. So I'm also sort of switching these multiple kinds of views in terms of disciplinary alignments in my own, own work as well. Um, and I want to repeat the often mentioned mantra um, that theory is also a praxis which highlights the role of concepts and theoretical, historical knowledge and topics, how they can play a role in framing questions of, for example, sensing across different scales. Mm, this is also already the mode of investigation um, we do with my collaborator, Abelard Hill Fournier, who was mentioned, who's been a part of, um, again, of these projects as well as a mentor, which is fantastic. And I believe also spoken about some of this work in a different earlier context. Um, he already spoke with the group, but also he might have mentioned also our joint project on scales of sensing and surfaces, surfaces of imaging and sensing and growth. So I'm not going to talk about this current work that we're doing with Abelardo so much. Um, most of my work has been on technological cultures, although I'm very much in the same boat as Shannon Matten when arguing that narrow, narrow models of computing and sensing or technological, um, um, you know, technological sensing won't be sufficient when dealing with the breadth of layers of what is sensing as well. This can be read against certain corporate technological visions of the smart city, but also it can be read to broaden the focus and scale of what is counted as sensing. To emphasize exactly this sort of a complexification of sensor regimes and planetary technologies has been proposed by many others already, by Jennifer Gabris, Benjamin Bratton, and many others. So, so in a way, the context is already well defined, as we know. With Shannon, uh, we developed similar perspectives in some of our joint work as well in a curatorial context in 2019 in Finland when we co-curated a small show at the Audi Library, which was then just new, um, just opened in Helsinki under the rubric of libraries, other intelligences, um, play with the notion of AI, not just as artificial intelligence, but as ambient, architectural, alien, animal intelligence, and more. We work with three artists to make the library itself into a sentient entity of um, audiovisual performances, infrastructural tours, and experimental alien languages. So our artists, um, Jenna Sutela, Tuomas Leitinen, and Samir Bomik, staged different projects that all dealt with this alien nature of the non-human as language, as soundscapes, as the infrastructural backdrop of an intelligent building. Um, so in this vein, um, I want to already, um, I want to, early on to outline that I find also curatorial contexts useful in outlining some of the scales in questions of sense and sensing that I will address briefly today. Um, the case of Audi, um, the art project and the, and the sort of architectural site, 
was related to exactly architectural um, 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 scales, the new public library and its technological infrastructure. But finding ways to narrate and rethink and reimagine that space was part of the curatorial way of thinking, what is sensing? A bit later, I want to think through some of the curatorial context of something I've been doing recently with Daphne Dragona, namely the Weather Engines exhibition that opens in Athens soon. Um, and from this perspective of sensing as well, weather systems and technologies as questions of large scale dynamic sense and sensing of complex entities that are formed in and through their own sensing as intensity. So in other words, I'm kind of a like, I don't do any kind of a heavy theoretical talk, but I'm interested in ending up with a punchline that sensing is also formative of those entities that do the sensing as well in a recursive loop. So I promised three and I, will try to deliver three, namely the three themes or scales or case studies that I'll briefly talk through, which include um, insect media, planetary sensing or geology of media, and indeed this curatorial way of thinking about sensing through many collaborative projects um, and, um, and as well. Um, so in terms of, um, <clears throat> I wanted to start by returning to insect media which is my work oh, from over 10 years back in this discussion that seems to respond well to the focus on sensing as well. It was a book that was written still in the context of media studies in a way, but already with a significant element related to questions of design and art and architecture in a particular hi cultural historical period of 150 years. Um, in short, um, this book claimed to be a sort of anti-Marshall McLuhan book, um, at least an anti-McLuhan argument that media are not extensions of man, definitely not the male man and the sort of a limited narrow scope of, of design projections that we know from a history of uh, Western thought quite often as well. Um, media are not extensions of man, but extensions of broader regimes of natural techniques that are often discussed through animal metaphors. Um, hence, the insect theme was carried over into a historical inquiry as well that started from birth of modern entomology in the 19th century. But it was not meant to be mere analysis of metaphors, but actually a sort of a map, a mapping, a cartography of design plans or projections of mathematics and cybernetics. In other words, the world of technological modeling that actually took quite often its reference to animal worlds or non-human animal worlds and, and uh, as, as its way of understanding what technology is. And it ended up with quite interesting, at least I find that, you know, I'm not talking about my work is interesting, but the references to, for instance, um, recent years of um, new materialist feminism where similar themes of, of sensing beyond the human form um, became adapted as what Rosie Bridotti calls post-human feminisms as well. Um, in some ways, insect media could be read as a cultural historical map of scientific, but also literary and artistic ways of framing insect and other animal sensing as alien intelligence. The olfactory, in other words, the things about, and I'm sniffing here, but it's because of allergy, I think, the olfactory, but also the chemical and other forms of communication that entomological sciences mapped um, and that were of key interest to 19th century scientists, but also popular science writers. They were carried forward, for example, to surrealist work of rereading aesthetics and sensing beyond a normalized human form. So the idea to investigate historical modes of sense with compound eyes, movement with six legs, and the sort of work around easily mysticized crowd intelligence that emerged in ant research of early 20th century were examples of rethink the network form beyond a technical definition. So the scientific fields and sometimes slightly less scientific takes on entomology, but also ethology, and others were part of this philosophical um, investigation into history of technology and history of, of technologies of scale and scaling and sense that emerges in relation to a particular non-human animal realm. I have emphasized in more recent times that this is my AI book of sorts, um, 
in the sense of outlining animal intelligence as the modus operandi of what um, the A stands for, for beyond modeling of intelligence as it emerges in the confines of current AI research as well. This is not necessarily obviously a opposite to any kind of a, you know, some of the strands of how we understand AI now, especially earlier artificial life research as well. Considering, for example, how distributed sensing and intelligence become, became a theme in robotics since the 1980s, and how this rifts with certain strands of cybernetics as well. Mm, software entities modeled on principles of learning became experimented in the 1980s and onwards. Uh, and one form of basic connection between intelligence that is not about knowing, but about learning obviously, and bootstrapping intelligence into a milieu of which, in which, through which one learns. Furthermore, the sort of cognitive science interested in cognition distributed outside the brain or without even, you know, you know in, in context such as insects, um, connected to the world and thus also creeping outside the tight sensorial skin of any human body becomes one version of the theme of insect media. What other modes of sensing are bootstrapped into a discussion of media than the McLuhan standardized human um, and, and as set, such becoming a critique of figures of man again in the, in the vein of critical post-humanities as well. Now, even with the risk of rushing through many complex contexts way too quickly, um, and I do that way too often as well, of um, sort of a somewhat rushing many things that need um, unpacking, but let's do it for, in the interest of time. I want to work, mention the work in Geology of Media as well, a book that followed insect media as, and it was part third part of the so-called Media Ecology Trilogy, um, um, of books. Uh, first one was Digital Contagions on Computer Viruses and Accidents on the non insect Media and then Geology of Media. In this context, um, the focus on planetary dimensions of advanced technologies amounted to a paradoxical claim that media history is Earth history. Media history is Earth history as far as it concerns identification, extraction, use and reliance on resources from rare earth minerals to fossil fuels. The petro-cultural drive of technical media is one trait of the book, while the other was decisively focused on scales. And hence, I wanted to again point out that I want to lift scales into, um, into my title of the talk, also because it's a really key concept that we're working with Abelardo at the moment. Um, so in this case, it was also about what geographical scale is media distributed on, at what temporal scale do we consider its effects beyond use. As such, geology of media was and could be read as one response to the question about planetary scale and planetary scale sensing. Perhaps it corresponds in a way to Earth layer in Benjamin Bratton's stack, but it also relates to the broader issue of medium design as identified by Keller Easterling. In other words, what are the conceptual and practice-based ways of dealing with design that is environmental, that is not merely focused on particular objects, and that is able to account for the material energies already in place, already in flux, already shaping environments, already shaping sensing and perceptions and more. At this point, it becomes clear that there is a trait of recursivity, recursivity in questions of sensing that I will return to later, but it relates to how any act of sensing is already all, also informing the entity of sensing in question as well. Sensing is an informative event. Um, for those of you interested in philosophy, I'm sort of echoing Simon Don here, that is born out of individuating resonances. But here you can observe how it riffs with insect media as two different kinds of attempts to think about where sensing is being observed, where does sensing take place. I hope that it also resonates with the work that is being presented in our event, work that conceptualizes, visualizes, thinks through and thinks with planetary movements, whether those of insects, of data streams, of different layers of energetic transfer that becomes included in the broad spectrum of mediations. 
Um, what I will I will leave this with slightly less attention in this talk is 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 though the actual operational images that define the scope of this scale of planetary media. This includes different ways of understanding volumetrics of the underground as per resources and as mapping resource extraction. The sort of images that are not images in the normal sense that employ, and in this case, they employ multi and hyperspectral imaging as in remote sensing. The format of images that is operational to echo Harun Farokki's quite often used term, um, which becomes central to a range of institutions from military, but also to environmental ob observation, including also then this um, extractive industries as well, um, um, as proven really well in multiple of the other people's work like Goethe and Al's work on, on operational images of extraction as well. And this sort of images of the world as data and as part of pipeline of logistics from the data sets to training sets to machine learning models and sometimes in relation to particle extraction operations as well. This is something that I deal with in my next book that is with the publisher now and in production, it should be out in early 23, which is simply titled Operational Images. And also as a further nod, um, also, um, Tiga's, Tiga Brain's work was, was really inspirational for some of the work that I did in this one. So I'm really happy to be on the same panel on the same day as, as Tiga. Um, um, th number three, to be on time. Um, I want to kind of uh, move, as mentioned, a bit quickly, but still across these three, three different examples and three different scales and all have to do with sensing. And this is something that is sort of working progress or sort of work just about to be released into the wild and that you can find if you Google weather engines as well. But I'll, I'll link it to our questions um, today. Approaching um, questions of planetary design and transdisciplinary arts and, for example, operational images, this form, um, this is one focus on how questions of scale come up in my work as well. What is scale of sensing is not that is not merely located on the axis of, you know, small, large or other pre-formatted measures of scale in that sense, but scale as about dynamics of formation of information. Without losing sight of new forms of technical sensing, I'm interested in this sort of a parallax view where techniques of sensing are read in relation to histories and case studies of materials of knowledge formations that somewhat seem off the beaten track and which can still offer inspiration for the sort of work we do in practice as well. And again, the sort of wonderful presentations that we're going to hear about soon as well. Um, different figures of natural sensing are embedded in the artificial systems, um, but to propose the cascade of figures of sense and sensation is also about feeding insights into aesthetics, how these projects can themselves build into a sense of an aesthetics as well, that is up to the task of making sense of our current situation. For example, to riff with Ayala Weisman and Matthew Fuller in their recent book on it, and their recent take on aesthesis with other human forms of sensing as um, what, what other forms of human, other than human forms of sensing can be ways of augmenting and playing, expanding and testing also what human sensing means. So in other words, we're constantly interested in this feedback loop of what is human and how it's, what is, in which ways it's being augmented in environmental contexts. Um, sorry about the sniffing again, it's, it's indeed allergy. Um, curatorial work is anyway in fundamental ways about creating patterns of sense and sensing across concrete spaces. I don't need to tell you this, many of people um, here, also our hosts are experts in these questions of thinking with space. I already gave a glimpse of some of the curatorial work earlier, but now in the last section, I want to return to a sort of a framing that happens in curatorial narratives, spatial thinking and artistic projects that work as part of our theoretical methods as well. Um, we are opening soon in Athens, April 1st, exhibition at Weather Engines, um, curated by myself and Daphne Dragona. The project started some two, three years ago, and it consists of an exhibition, a book, and a public program of talks and workshops and performances that, different, that deal with different modalities of weather. 
for, from advanced data and machine learning and even geoengineering technologies of weather to other modalities of embodiment sense as well as politics, we offer a particular atmosphere that itself becomes addressed as part of elemental politics. I won't talk through all the artworks, there's more than 20 of them, but I will want to give a brief window to our way of thinking and how it intersects with our theme today um, in the last, last sort of uh, eight minutes that I got left. Um, in the context of weather engines, I want to propose three interlinked ideas, and this is not just a full description of our curatorial thinking, so, um, but it's, it's, it's some of the interesting ideas that we've been putting together as well. There would have been also the curatorial note. Anyway, you'll find it online. Firstly, the first idea is that, and this apologies might be obvious as well, um, history of meteorology, history of weather, history of weather sciences of weather or knowledge about weather. And only this is of course, one particular Western instance as well. It's already full of examples of what could be easily called machine learning or data sciences at least. Distributed networks of sensing and observation as well as compilation of data points understood gradually also in the mathematical equations aimed at forecasting. That would be one version of trying to summarize in one sentence more than 100 years of meteorology. As documented in so many great books already, such as Marc Monnier's Air Apparent, meteorology, um, even before the computational methods of 20th century, was really involved in particular kinds of data-driven forecasting that senses not only the here and now, but builds models of potential, potential pathways, events, and patterns. For example, the late 19th century storms, storm tracks, and weather forecasting by Frank Bigelow consisted of a data set of what we would now call a data set, data set of 1,133 past storms that were recorded between 1884 and 1893, in order to compile a statistical understanding of possible or likely patterns across geographical space of the US per month. Here's an example. The observational data meant for comparison was thus already seen as part of a pipeline of gathering data of past events in order to model possible future ones. Secondly, whether to say the obvious, relates to techniques and technologies of war and colonialism in ways that makes the quest for decolonizing weather more than an empty metaphor. We sometimes use decolonizing um, slightly metaphorically, uh, but as we know and reminded by great scholars, it shouldn't be a metaphor as such. It's an actual, um, I mean, an actual context of violence. The sort of military context of measuring, knowing, and also engineering weather is one backdrop to the history of imperialism and weather. And here also the questions of sensing become part of the drill. What are the politics of sensing that also encompass the broader question of geopolitics and colonialism? Of current work in this vein and in our exhibition, we can mention Geo Cinema Art Dio's take on the Chinese remote sensing infrastructures and the data platform of Digital Belt and Road, DBAR. Um, as part of discussions of colonialism and data, as well as such fantastic cinematic works as Barbara Marcel's Project Cinecipo, um, that takes the Amazon tall tower uh, as its central architectural feature, but works its way through um, with indigenous activists who temporarily occupy it and transform it into a community radio site. Hence, techniques and technologies of weather are also sensorial regimes that also need to link up with questions of climate justice. Thirdly, the broader sensorial regime of weather as well as climate research leads to think of sensing as dynamic interaction of events and processes. This is not only about object-based models of sensing, but about dynamic systems as defined by this complexity of interaction and sensing and sensing incorporated into their emergence as wind, as waves, as pressure, as humidity. At the back of work in cultural theory on atmospheres and violence from Fanon to Christina Scharf via Achille Membert, um, um, and environments of interaction in movement, such as Masumi and Manning, as well as the earlier mentioned topics of medium design, we are really kind of a push to understanding that the model of sensing itself is a complex network of layers of sensing that also sense their own sensing as well. 
In other words, they are formed in that operation of sensing, which itself becomes political affect, it becomes an atmosphere, it becomes the ways in which we understand the dynamics of these um, different scales of sensing um, across, um, again, registers of politics and aesthetics. We do not only sense a cloud, a temperature, humidity, but they are formed in sensing operations in the first place as such in atmospheric chemistry, but also in these other registers of political affect as well. This recursive trait of sensing is a significant part of what I am interested in as aesthetics of weather. It emerges out of its own sensing of surroundings as a dynamic system that becomes an atmosphere of living in a fundamental sense that is close to critical post-humanities uh, and as, as appreciating this interface of not merely humans and their milieus of living as well. Um, I don't have much time, so I'm gonna really just scroll through um, um, the many, many really interesting projects like Manifest Data Labs, Carbon Topologies about data visualization, data concretization of carbon topologies to design Earth's ways of understanding the planet after geoengineering that we know from many contexts by way of their animated work and images. Matthias Fritsch's living installation of mycelium garden that itself creates an environment by the fungi that are in the installation. So creating microclimates as such, as a form of sensing, right? To um, many kinds of performative work in, in the context of, for instance, um, um, feminist performative work like Afrodi Dipsara and Audrey Brio's listening space. Um, that itself links up with weather infrastructures and forms these bodies of sensing to multiple other kinds of works like proxy climates, which deals with, well, relevant to my current state with pollen um, and as, as a particular form of an archive of past climates and future climates as well. We also um, edited um, a glossary which expands on these themes, including of themes of sensing called Words of Weather that is out um, probably next week in English and in Greek um, that you can order through Onassis, I believe, um, that sort of expands on these discursive factors that relate to physics, affects and politics from air and atmosphere to tropics, waves, wind and whatnot. As final words, um, to conclude, as forms of sensing, I want to bring this recursive trait into our discussion as well through these historical cases and of examples of sense and sensing. So the work from insects to planetary geophysics, geology, as well as weather becomes emblematic of this interest that is political and aesthetic into processes of sensing as they are fundamental to our lived condition. Um, I would be so happy to continue more questions emerging in relation to weather engines exhibition, but I want to give the floor to our wonderful um, um, and projects that are going to be um, interesting, wonderful and insightful examples of sensing in their own right. So I want to thank you and again, thanks to the wonderful you know, organizers and, and my colleagues um, in this event as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yossi, for this really inspiring uh, talk with so many references. I think there are so many interesting connections between the ideas and projects that you have been sharing with us and, and the projects that are going to be developed in the workshop, that it can be like very, very nice uh, to, to keep the conversation uh, with you. Um, so I, I, I hope we have some time at, at the end of the, of the session for some questions by the audience, if, if it, it is possible. But for now, we are going to move on uh, to the first uh, project that is going to be presented, which is called uh, Seno Image Dataset, and it's going to be presented by uh, Mar Oses and Miguel Rangel Gallardo. Uh, this uh, project is... Uh, uh, making this question, can non-representational -represent algorithmic images help us to build imaginary, imaginaries beyond gender? Seno image dataset aims to generate virtual material devices that allow us to hack the hegemonic visual imaginary by refunctionalizing image databases in order to disarticulate image management technologies. So they are going to, to tell us more about the project. Please, uh, Mar and Miguel, if you're 
Hi. Thank you very much, Laura, for the presentation. Well, let's share our screen. Well, hello, everyone. First of all, we would like to give you a little insight on who we are, so you get to know us a little better and also on what we do. As Laura has just stated, my name is Maro Ses, and I'm here with my mate, Miguel Rangil. We are both a couple of artist researchers and we've been thinking together since 2019. Our work is focused on the problematic issues related to digital technologies in the current on-life context. In our most recent projects, we are interested in the visuality of artificial intelligence and gender studies. These projects have been presented in various exhibitions and events in Madrid and Valencia. For the time being, we are both currently studying the Master in Visual Arts and Multimedia at the Polytechnic University of Valencia. Now, for the project, um, we present to you Seno Image Dataset, and its objective consists of the refunctionalization of image databases through a Seno Feminist lens via the elaboration of devices that alter and stimulate visual imaginaries with the help of AI in order to disarticulate image management technologies. So let's jump into it. Um, as you can see, these keywords are the ones that summarize the project. Visual epistems, databases, xenofeminism, artificial intelligence, and refunctionalization. Now, can non-representational algorithmic images help us build imaginaries beyond gender? And can we refunctionalize sentient media in a Seno key? These are the questions that motivate our project. By their initial configuration and productive genealogy, automated digital technologies tend to reproduce the regime of visual categorization through their predictions, suggestions, and prescriptions, right? There is an algorithmic non-neutrality in digital technologies, which replicate through their operability a vision that is far from reality. The images that the image databases that configure the dominant visuality are the ones that regulate the processes in the internet. Machine learning, AI, or Internet of Things, all this technological corpus of sentient media is fed by images with gender rubrics that replicate algorithmic standardization and exclude all alternative subjectivity from both physical and also digital spaces. In order to stimulate the conversation around this topic, we consider the image generated by artificial intelligence an element of great performative, aesthetic, and transformative agency. In front of these images, our gaze is dissolved. This is a sign that our scopic regime can be disarticulated, that complex realities exist and continue to be generated and cannot be understood through current visual epistems. Therefore, relying on AI images, it may be possible for us to generate visualities free of a gender rubric and that consequently do not function as support for systems of oppression, of oppression of some bodies over others, but rather as potential identity operators arising from a representational vacuum. These will be considered the Seno images. In conclusion, in conclusion Seno image dataset aims to generate operational devices, both physical and digital, that allow hacking the hegemonic visual imagery through their functionalization of image databases. We want to activate the visual future in the field of gender disruption by relying on AI as a new sensory visualization tool from a Senate feminist perspective. These are some formalization suggestions that we came up with. First of all, we consider Senate image dataset as framed in the specul speculative field. Working on producing images is a really complicated complicated task. So we consider it convenient to propose several frameworks of action for this project, as you can see. We propose several starting points as the elaboration of a database of AI images that functions as a hacker tool or as a database for the construction of new tools. Also, another option will be the development of an online digital tool that transforms images from an existing database into AI images or Sino images. And lastly, the construction of a physical digital image infection device to help us reformulate existing database 
and with the possibility of making it a portable physical prototype. These are only some of our suggestions, and we hope that given the nature of these works of itself, we promote collaboration among multiple agents. The proposals presented here will transform, mutate, and vary in new ways and unexpected results. We want to propose an open schedule that leaves rooms for the future interventions of the collaborators. That is one of our main goals. With this in mind, we propose the first sessions of the residency as spaces for conversations, debate, and brainstorming regarding the concrete formalization of the project. The materializations of the prototype will take place during the following days until the end of the workshop. Lastly, as for the description of the collaborator's profile, we consider that the presence of diverse profiles is crucial, from people with more technical knowledge to those who want to contribute with their vision from a life experience crossed by gender issues. These are some of the forcing profiles, although the project surely welcomes the unexpected. From programmers with knowledge in databases to Senos adjectivities who want to contribute through their experience and located knowledge. Also programmers with knowledge in the elaboration of web pages, since we believe that a digital, a digital space could be a good starting point to place the prototype. And also people who work with images and or theorize about them. As we have just stated, the unexpected is more than welcome. So although your profile might not match the ones here, most likely we will be delighted to have you with us. And that's it. Thank you very much. We hope to see you all soon. I don't know if, if there are any questions uh, for them at the YouTube chat. If not, well, we, we will move to the next project, uh, which is uh, called Extrasensory Excesses, Imagining Inclusions with Discarded Data, and it's going to be presented by Tim Coley Show. Uh, the project is an investigation into the blind spots of sensory systems, which are already in place in the city of Madrid, through their open data portal. And uh, it proposes to investigate their politics and the exclusions they make, and also a way to speculate and make real alternative worlds that are more just and inclusive for human and more than human actors and agents. So please, uh, Tim, you can go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Kalashaw. I'm a, I guess, a designer, technologist and researcher of various um, various shapes. I've been working with um, digital media in various forms for a long time and I'm currently in, enrolled in the PhD programme at BAO in Barcelona um, and my thesis is investigating digital wastes um, by which I don't mean um, I don't mean devices, kind of phones, kind of discarded material things but rather looking at um, practices around discard of kind of, of, of data, essentially, of images, of files, of things like this, as a way of understanding, um, or a way of developing post-human perspectives on digital design, uh, perspectives that go beyond um, go beyond use uh, as a sort of guiding principle. Um, so this um, to this sort of fits within my interest is for my PhD uh, and I think the thing that um, really captured my attention about the call was this idea of thinking about uh, data infrastructures, thinking about um, uh, sort of means of understanding the world via, uh, via technology as sensory organs, as kind of as, um, as kind of the senses of a kind of communal body. Um, and one of the interesting things about this I think is this idea of kind of societies or collectives as a, a body that sort of defined collectively is quite an old one. This goes back to kind of Hobbes's Leviathan, and I think Durkheim as well had um, kind of ideas about a society as a kind of collective subject. Um, and, and this idea that uh, our kind of infrastructure can act as the sort of senses of that collective body, um, I thought was very interesting. Um, in particular, um, I'm interested in how this kind of relates to more recent, uh, more recent work, the kind of post-human turn and thinking about uh, about life and about and kind of in biology, but also in in design, um, because this sort of um, 
thinking about stuff like Lynn Margulis endosymbiosis and the idea that it kind of calls into question the idea of individuals as a subject, as a kind of a cohesive kind of person and kind of um, when we're assemblage, um, assemblages of other other lives, other agencies that kind of live within us. This both kind of complements um, this idea of the kind of the, the collective body, but it also problematizes it because this, um, which slide have you got? I'm so sorry, my computer is terrible. Um, I hope we have the Leviathan again. If not, I will just carry on talking. Um, so um, this kind of both kind of like resonates with these sort of older ideas of kind of of, of collective bodies but also problematizes them because um, because this idea of the the kind of the collective as a a sort of human like form made up of individuals kind of relies on the idea that the collective is a kind of cohesive subject with um, with with an individual agency and that it is kind of made up of subjectivities which are kind of I guess hegemonic which are kind of tend to be tend to be white, tend to be Western, tend to be male, um, and also importantly, tend to be human. Um, so my interest in the kind of um, the sensory side of this uh, comes from a kind of, I didn't really have a kind of succinct way of putting this till Yussi's talk earlier, and he mentioned that, that sensing is also formative, that when we, when we sense something, um, sensing things bring stuff into being, but it also brings these kind of these subjectivities into being like my our senses to some extent form form the kind of divide between the stuff that's included in the kind of the body or the self or the subject and that which is left outside so as such a kind of sensing is a form of classification like when we when we decide what we're looking towards we're kind of deciding what gets included and what gets excluded and when you think about this, when you think about society in these terms, you're kind of you're thinking about questions of justice, questions of politics, question about who gets included in the kind of body politic and who gets to remain outside as a thing that is observed. Um, so, yes, I've got ahead of myself. Sorry. So it's the kind of selectivity of this is important. There's always this tension between um, the kind of standardization which is implied in kind of in infrastructure and in building this collective and the kind of needs of the individual within it. So what I'm proposing, I guess, is um, using this metaphor of the sensory apparatus of a society and a sensory infrastructure as kind of the, the support for this idea of a collective body of a collective subjectivity. Um, I think that's it helps us to understand questions of inclusion, uh, questions of questions of justice, by thinking more about the kind of um, the blind spots of this infrastructure, the things that are left out, the things that aren't sensed, um, uh, and to think more about how we can how we can identify the kind of neglected uh, neglected parts of our collective life, the things that aren't recorded, and how we can expand our idea of what it means to sense collectively in order to include the people, the agencies, the um, the actors that are left out of that of that collective view. Um, and in particular, um, given we're going to do this at Madalero, uh, it will be interesting to think about this from the point of view of the city of Madrid uh, and the city of Madrid as a, collect as, as a collective. So kind of concretely, um, this is going to be a kind of workshop in three parts or a kind of task in three parts. And the first thing is this identification of blind spots, this thinking about the um, uh, thinking about the um, the things left out of our ways, our ways of sensing the kind of the um, the exclusions. And one way to do this is to look at the Madrid uh, open data uh, open data portal. So there's a um, a whole repository of kind of municipal information uh, information about all aspects of or all kind of recorded aspects of life in the city of Madrid. And using some techniques which come from the public data lab, who are a sort of collective of people working in the UK and Netherlands, but uh, all over the world, looking at ways of identifying what is left out of these indexes, and in particular, who is affected by that, who is excluded by that, and what um, what forms of life are therefore rendered invisible by the by their the lack of their lack of capture within these these systems we use to. Kind of articulate what it means to be a collective body. Um, the second step uh, from doing that is then to attempt to 
uh, sorry, back one, uh, to attempt to identify ways of ways of bringing these these excluded um, excluded agencies, excluded people, excluded things into the collective body. Um, and I would like to do this by a very open ended process of inventing sensing mechanisms, inventing new uh, new ways of apprehending the world, new ways of um, new ways of making visible or recording things that were previously excluded. Um, I'm thinking about this in a very, very broadly defined way. Um, so we're looking at kind of creative interventions as a method. So any kind of any kind of form of uh, performance prototype intervention is kind of like is kind of acceptable here. What we're aiming to do is to make interventions in within the city in which we're working that will highlight aspects of life that were previously uh, previously in the city. Um, the third part of this is a a kind of speculative part. So, kind of joining together this idea that um, the senses constitute constitute the body. Uh, I think after having kind of made visible things that were previously invisible, there is there is um, work to be done around around thinking about how that affects kind of life in an ongoing way, how that affects the kind of the the society. We live in and the kind of futures made possible by um, by revealing or by making visible previously excluded things. So we will uh, we will continue from that point, thinking, uh, reflecting on the new information we've gathered, the new kind of points of view we've um, we've made visible, um, and we'll take part in some speculative exercises to think about um, the kind of the kind of possibilities that affords, the kind of um, uh, the ways in which uh, life society might be might be impacted by um by our attempts to include new points of view um very finally because i'm yeah moment 30 seconds uh, a little note on the kind of participants i'm looking for um much like the zeno image data set team i'm uh, my main priority here is to be as kind of open as possible um i think this type of this type of work benefits from having um a variety of people uh, with kind of like curiosity and kind of a willingness to participate in this type of creative work. Um, however, I'd like to highlight that I think um, we're dealing with a very specific geographic location here. We're dealing with life within a specific um, a specific city, um, and to that end, I'd really I'd really be keen to hear from people who have some sort of personal link with our kind of field of investigation who have. Um, who either live or work or have kind of have roots in in the city of Madrid, and in particular, any kind of any historically underrepresented collectives, any um, any uh, particularly any marginalised people in whatever form, I think it's very would be very very important to include um, to include kind of a diverse a diverse set of voices in this um, in this project. Um, I guess one small note on that I've kind of I didn't include this in the proposal because I again it isn't a massive priority, but in terms of facilitating this, I think it would also, if there are people who have either kind of sociology, social research backgrounds who are particularly enthused or anyone who does data science who is particularly enthused by this, um, even though I'm not specifically looking for participants with specific skills, there is definitely stuff on the kind of facilitation side that could do with that type of expertise. So if anyone is kind of grabbed by this and does have those specific skills, please, please get in touch. Um, but otherwise, really, anyone who is kind of enthused by this idea as possible and kind of has uh, creative ideas to bring to the table would be, would be perfect. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Tim, for your presentation. Uh, so we have uh, listened to uh, two of the selected projects. As you can see, uh, they have uh, very, two inter very interesting proposals and, and, and a plan to, 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 de to develop it, but uh, the projects are open, as you see, for uh, the um, contributions of uh, collaborators. So that's why uh, we have this open call for, for collaborators and they are looking for these different skills, profiles, but also different points of view and perspectives that can bring uh, what these uh, projects need to, to be developed during this uh, prototyping workshop. So we, we encourage you again to, to look for this uh, uh, open call for collaborators and, and see more about the, the conditions and how you can apply. 
Uh, so we are going to, to move on now to the next uh, invited speaker. And we would like to, to welcome uh, Luisa Crossman. Uh, Luisa, we uh, will be having an artistic residency at Media Lab for the coming months. Uh, and now uh, she will be presenting us the work that she's going to be developing in Madrid. Um, I'm going to briefly present her. She's an artist and writer. Uh, her work spans installations, speculative design, education, and institutional dynamics with a special interest in infrastructural methodologies. She explores the feedback between forms of human organization, new technologies, and global and planetary systems. So please, uh, Luisa, you can start. Yeah, so hello, I'm Luisa Krosman. I'm based in Sao Paulo, but was invited to be in Madrid for the next few weeks uh, by Media Lab and Matadero. I would like to thank them very much for commissioning uh, this residency and this new work, this new research that I'm gonna be doing while there. And also for organizing this online event so I can present a little bit what I'll be doing, but also to get to know all the projects uh, that will also be happening while I'm there. And also it's great just to be in conversation with Juicy and Vega, which are very inspirational. Um, I do have a, a, a small disclaimer. I have a not so mild case of COVID at the moment. <laughs> so I apologize if I start coughing because I start coughing when I start talking. And also if I have to like take a break to sip some tea, uh, but hopefully this will go smoothly. So the work that I'll be doing is for now, uh, is the working title is Atropos Sky. And the work is to propose to look into the sky landscape as the drawing of patterns from multiple perspectives and a few different methodologies. Uh, one can find in many books and films and usually in culture, uh, the sky as this all uh, inducing entity uh, the, the starry nights are very inspirational. The materiality of the sky is quite mysterious, uh, but at the same time, its solidity is very protective. And because the sky holds so many different qualities, uh, so many different features, it has been a medium of many of humanity's investigations. So to look into these investigations will be my starting point for uh, the research at Tropos Sky. My main proposition at this point is to look uh, at the sky as an interface, a place from where we can extract information and where we've been extracting information uh, from a long time. So localization and positioning, for example, navigation, weather prediction, future telling like astrology, but also other, uh, uh, other traditions, theological myths, existential narratives. The sky, the sky has always been a medium through which we ask ourselves, what is our place? The combination of time and space in the cosmos. I would like to perhaps turn this question around and to investigate then how the sky is an interface, not of future visions or future times, but of our present time and our current narratives. <laughs> Sorry, just a second. So this means looking at the sky through feedback mechanisms and understanding how it can inform possible visual narratives for climate indexes, such as the ones that you're seeing on screen from Bloomberg uh, Green, but also climate modeling and climate managing. So policy making, for example, and geopolitical discussions. So this research uh, actually comes as a development, <coughs> excuse me, of previous projects and works uh, in which I look into the technologies and systems relating to climate modeling and technologies, future narratives, and infrastructure of prediction. So in the screen, you're seeing uh, a few images of the weather report girl. The Weather Report Girl was a performative lecture that I did on Zoom uh, in the year of 2020 during the pandemic. The idea was basically to have two Louises. One was the news anchor, which we're seeing with the green screen, and the other one was the reporter, uh, the Weather Report Girl. 
Uh, it started as this one off work, but now it has uh, gone bigger into a research frame, which is also informing the Atroposky research. It investigates uh, the relationship between weather forecast formats and our imagination about this world and other worlds. So this performance specifically took advantage of the internet platform, such as we are now in Zoom, to have the simultaneity of two Louises in conversation. The idea was to develop through this conversation a series of, uh, if, to deliver, sorry, a series of information about the history of the weather prediction and also how this informs the way that we look into the world and think about the planet. It also took special interest in the figure of the woman within uh, this both infrastructural but also news media uh, atmosphere. So the history of climate uh, prediction, uh, while it's told through the discovery of many men, used to actually use the work of a lot of women in the backstage as data processing and mathematicians uh, in order to be able to compute the information that was acquired uh, through the infrastructure and apparatus uh, systems. It also investigated the idea that usually the weather report girl would be this break in the news system, right? With very heavy uh, uh, news being delivered and the weather was supposed to be this kind of more light moment in the news system, in the news media. Right now, the climate is our most pressing urgent matter. So in the, in the work, I also kind of play around with this idea of gender, of feminist studies and how the information and infrastructure apparatus usually does a play of hide and seek with that. By the end of this work, I explored also how actually the weather forecasting and atmospheric uh, sensing not only informs the way that we see Earth, but also exoplanets, which are planets that are uh, beyond our solar system. How they actually create or help create images or places uh, due to data processing, but also of storytelling, narrative, atmospheric creation. As I said, this work uh, is actually now a broader research framework, which I'm actually thinking in the sense of uh, this and the next slide uh, topics. So the first is the idea of signals as the seventh sense. So we all know the basic five human senses. I'm leaving the sixth sense uh, as a mystery, uh, each person can have its own sixth sense uh, narrative. And the seventh sense then as many authors, uh, such as for example, I would say here, uh, Juicy, but Breton and others uh, propose the sensor layer, this geological media layer. <laughs> <Excuse me. coughs> so that's basically the combination of all the apparatuses uh, that provides us with information beyond our cognitive uh, human capability. The other topic that I'm also thinking uh, through this research is the idea of cosmic prototypes. So I'm very interested in this idea of creating cosmic prototypes, departing from a planet's atmosphere and to develop a narrative around its social organizations, governance and infrastructures. So for example, one example is the Anahes planet, which is a moon planet uh, developed in the book, The Dispossessed by American rock writer Ursula Le Guin. In that story, the fact that the planet, which is a moon, had so severe conditions of atmos atmosphere, but also geological humidity and etc., actually uh, inform how the, the organization and the governance and the resources are managed. This is just another image. <laughs> Excuse me. So the second project that also informs a lot this current research is Cosmos Law, which was a research project developed during the terraforming program at Strelka, uh, together with Vlad Afanevzev and Elena, Elena Dejarnia. Uh, in this research, we looked at to how the legal framework and governance models could be used to actually, uh, the current legal framework and governance models of outer space could be used to replace uh, an outdated, outdated way of managing researchers on earth. 
So the, the research looks into the history of land occupation on Earth and exploration of outer space. And it prop and propose, proposes after the, a model for which we can match uh, the planetary conditions and planetary governance as a way to reverse the current clim climate change conditions. So we looked into how uh, Earth expansion through the sea and also the occupation, usually through colonization uh, methods, happened on Earth, how this helped uh, shape a legal uh, apparatus for the justification of occupation of land, how this actually afterwards was a framework that informed the legislation of, uh, of outer space, and how the sensing layer of outer space, the ground segment, the orbits, and all, all of this is actually connected. So the basic question uh, that we proposed during this research was what if instead of looking uh, as, Earth, as space as an expansion of Earth, we actually look at Earth as being part of space. So it's a kind of epistemological change in perspective that actually helped us build a holistic legal framework for managing uh, Earth's resources, which we called uh, Cosmos Law. So in Cosmos Law, uh, we investigated how this terrestrial expansion and sea exploration led to this colonizing framework and later helped shape this outer space legislation. And now I would like to investigate on how atmosphere, airspace, and the sky can also be a figure in geopolitics. <laughs> so the sky's landscape uh, is pure movement. It changes colors, it changes density. It reveals the biochemistry of the atmosphere. So in which ways does the sky and the weather relate? How to create narratives based on these relationships? My initial question, sorry, my, my initial idea is to use a methodology proposed by Lisa Nesseri, uh, who is an American anthropologist, uh, who develops uh, a methodology that she develops in her book, Placing Outer Space. Uh, she develops this methodology while looking into the relationship between astronomers, the telescope satellite infrastructure, and data. And she proposes then three forms of observing. Observing at, observing with, and observing from. For Missetti, observing at is to observe inhabiting the observatory. <coughs> Excuse me. Inhabiting the observatory, the telescope. To observe, sorry, <clears throat> um, uh, to observe, uh, so observing inhabiting the observatory. To observe with is to observe with an apparatus located in space. And so here I'm gonna quote her. There is no observatory to inhabit, so the astronomer instead inhabits a social technical network. And finally, to observe from is to observe from a specific theoretical and ideal point called Archimedean point. According to Misery, and I'm gonna quote her again, when observing from an Archimedean point, an astronomer inhabits a cognitive space and imagine isolation, neither grounded on earth, nor accessible via an, a network. This Archimedean point is imagined by theoreticians who ask what earth would look like as an exoplanet. Here, the observing eye is placed at such a great distance from earth that when it looks back, earth has dissolved into nothing more than a point. Can astronomers discern from this point that living beings inhabit the world? So I'm not sure uh, how I'm gonna transform this, met this methodology, uh, what I'll have to do in order to be able to observe at the sky, with the sky, and from the sky. But by filming, writing, and modeling techniques, I intend to try and inhabit a uh, Madrid sky, as Messeri would say. Radical speculation will also be a methodology for my research and events such uh, as what happened last week in Madrid when the Sahara dust <coughs> turned the sky <coughs> orange uh, could possibly maybe start a science fiction scenario. What would happen if our skies turned a different color? In August, 2020, I was in Sao Paulo uh, 
I was in the middle of mounting a show and suddenly at three o'clock in the afternoon, the sky turned very dark and very reddish. It felt ap apocalyptic as if the sky was better, better of bad news. And it did, it was. It was smoke from criminal, criminal activity in the center of Brazil. The agribusiness was burning Pantanal, one of the last and most important environment reserves in the world located in the center of Brazil. They were burning it in order to be able to plant more soya beans and raise cattle. So one usually don't consider the sky as the immediate medium for ground activities. Perhaps we should. <clears throat> and lastly, I'm also interested in bringing to the research, uh, which gives it its name, the Atropos or the Fates painting <coughs> from Spanish painter Goya, which is currently at the, the Prado Museum. <coughs> Museum. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, so the painting that depicts Las Parcas, which is uh, which are mythical figures that control the dis the destiny of humankind. Uh, so you can see here Las Parcas. They usually have uh, a thread which corresponds to human life, and they can cut it and shape it according to their will. Uh, and they are located against a back a sky backdrop, which I find quite interesting. I also find quite interesting <coughs> that this painting is part of the black paintings for Goya. So the sky here and the atmosphere is very heavy, dark, and full of actual uh, Goya's <coughs> critical, <coughs> critical ideas and concerns towards Spain. The conceptual ideas of fate, time, <coughs> Control and prediction present in this work in the figures of four women are key for a possible development of many of these research lines of work. <coughs> Can a painting be a form of telescope, a form of satellite? How do sky patterns inform us about the current state of the world? How observation techniques are instruments of narrative control and speculation? These are a few questions that I'm gonna start my research with. And I hope that I can share with you more during the coming weeks. Thank you. And I'm sorry for all the coughing, at least it's on Zoom. So there's no risk of infection. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Luisa, uh, for making the, the effort to be here with, with us uh, in, in your situation. It has been really inspiring. And we are looking, really looking forward to meeting you in, in, in Madrid. And, and I think we can take advantage of your stay to, to make these connections with also with the prototyping workshop and the projects. Uh, and, and it can be very inspiring and helpful to have you there. So uh, we wish that you recover very soon. Um, we are going now to, to move uh, on again to uh, the other two projects that are going to be presented this afternoon. Um, now we will listen to the presentation of the uh, project Real Time World Rack, which uh, aims to create a tangible real time world rack that uh, visualizes current global conflicts by blurring the boundaries between traditional racks and technology. It's going to be presented by Zainab, Tariq, and Rita Epergesi. Thank you, Lara, for the introduction. Um, we're gonna share our screen. So yeah, as Lara said, um, the project we're gonna present is real-time war work. Um, so I'm Zan Taik, I'm a creative technologist from Berlin. And this is Rita, she's also a creative technologist and a, and a designer uh, based in Berlin, but originally from Hungary. Uh, we also have in our team, Anna, who is also a creative technologist and we had Fanny, who is a, a psychologist and a designer. Um, so yeah, what we aim to create is, as the name says, um, a rug. It's gonna be a visual and tactile representation of the currently ongoing political conflicts um, by applying the semantic and the visual language of Afghan war rug. Um, the visualization um, of these 
politi political uh, conflicts and hotspots is going to be a re real time and we're going to represent it in a kind of like an abstract world map. Yeah, and we don't know if you're familiar with the non real time war rags. So here are a few examples. And uh, Fanny got fascinated by the topic that uh, these rugs originate in Afghanistan. And after the Soviet Union invaded their uh, country, the rug makers started to incorporate these elements and symbols of war uh, in their art. Oops. And uh, <laughs> we find it fascinating also from the psychological point of view that these uh, collective traumas happen and then they just turn into everyday objects and people even walk on these traumas. And uh, we are very curious about this topic and uh, these symbols and everything. And we are quite privileged in our Central European position that uh, wars are not part of our everyday lives. Um, but uh, like there's the Ukrainian situation, but even before we were thinking that there are wars in the world, but we, we are lucky in our bubble and we just, it's so easy to ignore the fact that people are suffering in other places and there are wars. Um, so we want to create an object which brings this quad reality of the outside world into our homes with a very warm and um, peaceful object. I don't know how peaceful it is, but it's a warm <laughs> object. <laughs> Um, so yeah, what we basically want to create is um, a two-layered rug. One layer is going to be static and the second layer is going to be on top of it, where we have um, like moving parts of the rug. We call these um, moving pixels or soft pixels. So yeah, so basically it's going to be like war symbols and then depending on where conflicts are happening in the world, those pixels will move. So how does it work? Um, we will, uh, first of all, get a data set of uh, different conflicts uh, in the world. For that, we will use um, this website, uh, Global Conflict Tracker, which um, like shows uh, in real time different conflicts happening all over the world. And also, like we can get location of those uh, conflicts um, uh, through this website uh, by data scraping. Yes, and want to, we want to create a real-time visualization of these, uh, these conflicts on a map. We want to use the design and the symbolism of the original war rocks, and we want to have like an abstract visualization of the world map. And we want to put all these things on a rug. Um, for that, we want tough thing, like to create the rug, and we need physical computing to make things move. And we don't know if you're familiar with the, this rug making technique, which is new. And I watched so much Instagram videos about this. Um, and the very ironic thing is that it's also made with a gun uh, and then it creates rugs. Yeah, and like um, we were inspired by um, this uh, artistic piece, A Million Times 288 by humans since 1982 where we can see like um, these clock like elements moving and we kind of like want to want to create something similar but not exactly the same um, to give you some like kind of like a feeling where we are getting at um, exactly and for like the mechanical part or, or the technical part of these moving pixels um, we are kind of going to use uh, motors that are connected to a microcontroller. So here it's kind of like an abstract um, visualization of the circuit, which is like only connected to two motors. We will use uh, multiple motors, probably um, over 30 motors. Um, that's why we are looking for um, also collaborators who are familiar with this kind of things like physical computing. So for the one person that uh, would be good to collaborate with would be uh, a person who is uh, good with engineering, physical computing, and then another uh, like developer who is familiar with um, Python development who can connect these um, motors uh, to the data. Um, third would be like 
someone who could help us with data scraping, although we are familiar with it, we know how to do it, but we are not experts in it. So we would appreciate uh, help in that as well. <laughs> no, it's not working. <laughs> no. uh, yes, and uh, this is it for today. And obviously we would rather wish for peace in the world. So we hope our Vorag will be just a static thing at the end. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zainab and Andrita, for your presentation. Uh, I remind that you can send questions through the uh, YouTube chat if you have any questions for the projects, and or maybe uh, any of the other projects or invited speakers if they want to also to to ask or comment on the projects. Uh, of course, you can you can also do it. Um, there is one project left after our last uh, talk, uh, which is uh, the project called Life Trajectories, the Traveling Insects of the Earth. Uh, this project is going to be presented by uh, Epsuariba Hernandez Gomez and Daniel Marcial. The project, the project is based on a system of detection and registration of trajectories and a collective mapping in public space. And we'll try to trace the roots of uh, hymenopterans, lepidopterans, and beetles, different kinds of insects. The detection will be done by installing a camera, camera device in one or several places defined by the mapping. They are going to tell us more about the proposal and the collaborators they are looking for. Gracias por la introducción y a quienes siguen conectadas, conectados en esta transmisión. Uh, hello, um, I am, we are, I am Hev, we are Daniel and Hev. Uh, we live in Mexico. Our project for the Medio Sintientes Lab is a viral trajectories, the traveling insects of the earth. We are going to tell you a little about us and some characteristics about the project. Um, then, our families have a peasant origin, and even we were born and live in Mexico City, we have to return to our village to see our parents and grandmothers. In these trips, we have seen how the developing industry changed the natural environment. For example, for example, there are fewer trees and more cattle and monocultures. You can see few beans, and it is common that farmers use chemical fertilizers. And finally, in our country, environmentalists are killed. Eh, nosotros, Daniel y yo, vivimos ya en la Ciudad de México. Sin embargo, tenemos eh, nuestra familia aún vive en distintos estados de la República en Guerrero y en Oaxaca. Y cuando nosotros regresamos a visitarles, notamos el cambio en el ambiente. Hay menos árboles y hay más monocultivos, hay más eh, sí, espacios eh, desérticos. Tú puedes ver que hay menos insectos. Eh, es común que los agricultores y agricultoras usen fertilizantes químicos y bueno, en nuestro país Eh, se mata y desaparecen a personas dedicadas a defender el territorio. Mm, yeah, thank you. Uh, for this project, we decided to focus on in the insects because they are considered, from an anthropocentric, general, and short informed perspe perspective, as inferior life forms or insignificant lives. Eh, nos vamos a centrar en los insectos porque desde una perspectiva antropocéntrica, general y poco informada, son considerados como menores o vidas insignificantes, bueno, varios de esos insectos. In a daily life, bugs are often considered disgusting. We kill them immediately and the first opportunity, like this. We call, we call to the pest control worker, we consider them invaders in our houses, and some bugs are synonymous with dirt. Maybe 
they are so insignificant that we have not even noticed their extinction. Eh, la mayoría consideramos algunos insectos eh, desagradables eh, y en la primera oportunidad de su ruido los matamos. Eh, y bueno, también llamamos rápidamente a la persona que se dedica al control de plagas, los consideramos unos invasores de nuestras casas. Then, according to the research worldwide decline of the entomofauna, a review of its drivers published in 2019, In the last decade, we experienced the extinction of 40% of the insect population in the world. The causes are the destruction of their habitat and its use for agriculture and urbanization, excessive use of pesticides and chemical fertilizers and climate change. Bueno, hemos experimentado en las últimas décadas la extinción de cerca del 40% de la población de los insectos en el mundo y varias de sus, bueno, esto a causa más bien de la agricultura, eh, la destrucción de sus hábitats para la agricultura y la urbanización, el uso excesivo de pesticidas y fertilizantes y por supuesto el cambio climático, lo cual afecta especialmente a los insectos que viven en, los, en, el, en climas tropicales. Um, the extinction of box halters and will alter the life in all ecosystems of the world because they are necessary for the pollination, pardon, the pollination process in natural control of plague and are food of other spaces and play an important role in nutrient recycling for the restoration and the life of soils. Es muy importante uh, la participación de los insectos en los diversos ecosistemas porque ellos son necesarios para el proceso de polinización. Ellos controlan de forma natural algunas otras plagas, eh, también son el alimento de otras especies y quizá de las cosas más importantes es que cumplen un rol muy importante en el, en el proceso de, de cuidado y de restauración de los suelos. En eh, este context, contexto, we propose to look down to see where bugs care for their ways and record their trips in the places which we share with them, like a flower pot, gardens, the fruit field, parks, streets, walls in the cities. What are we going to do in this project? Well, the project is organized in two stages uh, that occur sim simultaneously. These two stages are first a collective mapping in the public space and the developing on an electro electronic device. Bueno, ¿qué vamos a hacer? Nuestro proyecto lo dividimos en dos etapas que ocurren simultáneamente. Eh, una que es un mapeo en el espacio público y otra el desarrollo de un dispositivo electrónico. Eh, about the collective mapping. Mapping in the public space will allow us to place the project in a affective, geographical and political context in order to observe insects and its social dynamics. Through interviews and other observation methods, we are going to build precise guidelines for the second stage. The second stage is the develop of an electronic device with machine vision technology. We want to capture tracking visualize the insect trajectories. Eh, bueno, el mapeo en el espacio público nos va a eh, permitir situar el proyecto en un contexto afectivo, geográfico y político con el fin de observar las dinámicas sociales respecto a los insectos, cómo los ven la gente. Eh, a través de entrevistas y algunos otros métodos de observación, queremos hacer eh, guidelines para la siguiente etapa, que es el desarrollo de un dispositivo con tecnología de visión artificial para traquear algunas trayectorias de insectos. Eh, later, we will consider the best ways to use the information obtained by the two stage in order to achieve the project objectives. Eh, these ways would be notifications, tweets, graphics, installation. Eh, in the slide, I will have an example for the 
graphics, for example, you can have a tweet bot connected to the camera for generate notification when an insect travel in some place. Bueno, nosotros queremos este, usar la información del mapeo para ver la manera en que la información obtenida por estas etapas va a ser mostrada, la cual puede ser notificaciones, gráficos, tweets. Aquí en este ejemplo tenemos un tweet como que podría ser generado por una cuenta bot conectada a un dispositivo con un, una cámara que cuando detecte, por ejemplo, el insecto volando, genera este tweet. Y de esa manera, concientizar respecto a la importancia de la vida de los insectos. Eh, finally, we will create a post in an open source platform like GitHub eh, in order for the project to be replicated in other parts of the world. Queremos subir el, todos los resultados en GitHub para tener un post con la información para que otros puedan replicar el dispositivo en otras partes del mundo. Uh, and last, this is our collaborators' profiles. We are looking for persons with some of this knowledge, web design, machine vision libraries like OpenCV, Apeworx, programming, entomology, biology, or knowledge about insects uh, and environmentalism. This is, este es nuestro perfil de colaboradores. Buscamos gente con algunos de esos conocimientos, diseño web, conocimientos de visión artificial, programación, entomología, biología, insectos o ambientalismo. Uh, um, this is all. Thank you for hearing. We are going then to move to our last um, talk with our last invited speaker. And it's a, a pleasure to present uh, Tiga Brain. Uh, she's an Australian-born artist and, and environmental engineer whose work examines issues of ecology, data systems, and infrastructure. She has created wireless networks that respond to natural, natural phenomena, systems for obfuscating fitness data, and an online smell-based dating service. Those are some examples of, of the work that she is going to, to present to us now. Thank you very much, Tega Brain, for joining this webinar. We will listen to you. Hi, everyone. Um, let me just set up here for you all. OK. OK. Can everybody hear me OK? Fantastic. Um, so thank you so much for the invitation and for all these amazing projects and all of the, the work I'm hearing about today. It's really inspiring. Um, I'm an artist with a background in environmental engineering and my work over the past decade has been concerned broadly with like the politics of technologies and how they structure our ecology and our relationships within the environment. So this is both materially, like think about how they redistribute resources, but also conceptually. So like what ecological imaginations do they produce? Do they foreclose? Um, and, you know, these underlying questions of like resource and imagination are also questions of like agency. So how do these systems reconfigure agencies in different ways? How do they change how we make decisions and how we act in our ecology? Um, about five years ago, I got started to notice a growing excitement in the use of like AI and environmental management and intervention. So initiatives like the ones you see on the screen were popping up everywhere, like big investments from companies like Microsoft called AI for Earth, and all sorts of like experimentation with the use of um, artificial intelligence in the context of environmental intervention. You know, and so why is it such an evocative idea that we might automate and outsource ecological decision making to AI? Um, it's this sort of, there's an enduring argument here that like AI is sort of offers a more, more robust objective view of the world, that all that data must be doing something. Um, and that an, an argument, as you see made on the screen here as well, is another argument is that it sort of depoliticizes or neutralizes decision making. Um, and so this is something that the first work I want to share with you today addresses and explores. It's called Asunder made in 2019, and it was a collaboration with Julian Oliver and Bengt Sojan, 
Um, and it responds to this growing interest in the application of AI to critical environmental challenges by situating this approach as a literal proposition. Um, what's presented in this installation you see is an autonomous environmental manager. So that proposes and simulates and then models alterations to the Earth's surface. It produces what are often completely unacceptable and absurd results. Um, and it combines machine learning techniques, so like statistical approaches with sort of traditional environmental modeling techniques, which use, you know, more numerical approaches relying on, you know, physics and different, different methodologies. Um, so the system starts with the selection of regions. We chose regions that were showing remarkable environmental change. So you see on screen like the expansion of the, the Athabasca tar sands in Canada, it's a big mine and also the deforestation in um, Rondonia in Brazil. Um, and the environmental manager then generates an ongoing series of large scale geoengineering proposals um, for each of these regions. And I think there's about a dozen of them included in the work at the moment, we, we continually adding to it. Um, and so it generates sort of engineering proposals through use of a GAN or a generative ad adversarial network, a common technique for manipulating images using machine learning. Um, so again, is a generative model that is trained on a late, large data set of images. And the patterns in pixels of the images are interpreted as rules that are then used to generate new images in the styles of those that are in the data set, but that are unique in themselves. So in Asunder, we trained again on publicly available satellite imagery from Landsat 8. Um, and the resultant software model is then used to generate this fictional satellite imagery, which is then projected you know, at scale, becoming these sort of uncanny environmental engineering scenarios. Um, and so the system generates a multitude of options for these selected regions on earth. Um, it then selects one and then proceeds to interpret the fictional land use, uh, the, the fictional tile in land use parameters. So we actually take that GAN generated tile and attempt to interpret it in land use parameters that are then put into a climate model that um, is constantly running in the space and simulating the, the um, scenario um, in, in a sort of uh, industry climate model. And so in this way, the work sort of also conspicuously puts these two approaches to computational mo modeling and direct dialogue, you know, the statistical and the numerical. Um, the work's presented as this sort of large scale projection in the form of a data dashboard. And so we're also playing with how the, you know, this data driven perspective really shapes a sort of planetary imagination. You know, it gives this sense that you're, you've got this all seeing view of the world um, that, you know, there has been a, a lot of writing by folks like Shannon Matten about us, um, addressing this sort of dashboard view as well. Um, but the dashboard here presents this sort of machinic fiction, you know, that that might look fantastical, but are actually highly constrained, right? The images that are produced are actually highly constrained because they're coming out of this machine learning system. So like all machine learning, GANs can only produce imagery from the space of their training data. And in this way, Asunder is only able to re reproduce colors and textures that existed on Earth in the period of time, you know, that captured by that Landsat 8 satellite. And it points to a sort of one of the crucial limitations of machine learning systems in that they're highly conservative. They assume the past can predict the future. And this system can only dream what it's seen. It can't envisage a world outside the space of its statistical model. But, you know, as we all know, climate change and the fact we're now breathing an atmosphere we've never sort of, that's never been breathed by humans before, you know, assures us that future environments are certainly not going to be um, as any human or any machine learning system has known them to be. Um, so Asunder sort of probes and explores the characteristics of existing methods and imaginaries for AI um, in the context of environmental management. But in many ways, the work kind of extends the imagination of the present, right? It sort of extrapolates where we are now, this idea of, you know, machines automating um, our environmental decision making um, in a sort of large scale, you know, large computational format. Um, but, you know, what might be some ways that where we might hijack or reconfigure automated systems rather than simply extending where we are at present? 
And the other two projects I want to share today attempt this, right? And they attempt sort of producing an, an alternative imagination for thinking about automation um, in ecology. So this next work, Synthetic Messenger, uh, collaboration between myself and artist Sam Levine. Um, similarly, it probes um, how automated systems uh, shape our ecology, but through looking at the sort of media landscape and media systems. Um, specifically like responding to, you know, the experience of living in a time of climate emergency, where this image on the screen you see was like what Manhattan looked like for several days last summer. It really felt like something was on fire and this was smoke that was coming from the West Coast fires. So it was like a, a blanket of smoke stretching the American continent. Um, and yet at the same time, you know, climate change still fails to regularly make headlines or stay in the front page news. I mean, this is changing as it's becoming more, I think, tangible. Um, but like, for example, this was a, a sort of visualization that was being shared at the time on Twitter, um, showing, you know, attention given to sort of something Jeff Bezos was doing, space stuff and climate change. So you know, there's, there's this, this question of like, what role does media play in how we understand our ecology, I think is obvious here. Um, and yet, of course, the business model of the internet means that news outlets are relying on revenue by selling ads alongside their stories. So the more traffic a story receives, the more money it earns. Um, and there's this incentive to optimize news cover and journalism for views and clicks and signals that are assumed to indicate in human engagement. So Engagement data then also determines how stories are aggregated, shared and promoted. And it creates amplification, often without human decision making in the loop. So clicks and scrolls all determine the value of reporting on different issues, including issues, ex existential issues like climate. And so this work takes the form of a botnet. So a bot being an algorithmic process that is programmed to automatically carry out online activities such as sometimes generating text or clicking on content or listening to keyword or, ha or hashtags. Basically bots, you know, are there to simulate human interactions with online platforms. And a botnet is a large number of these algorithmic processes running together. And so our botnet is programmed with the goal of artificially inflating certain climate news stories. Every day the system searches the internet for recent news coverage of the climate crisis. And then these URLs are fed to the 100 bots, which each visit the articles and click on the ads running alongside them. So the bot drives traffic, synthetic traffic to climate reporting, and in doing so, you know, potentially amplifies this news, making this content more lucrative for the media outlets by generating ad revenue. Clicking on ads increases the value of these articles and the hierarchy of articles on news websites is determined by this kind of data. So the question is, you know, like we were interested in like whether this sort of intervention could um, be a way to encourage media companies to invest more resources into the stories and these the topics that are appearing to, to drive um, more traffic. And so this project is basically like building one automated system to talk to another. So it's like bots talking to bots. Um, and as our system attempts to draw more attention to the climate crisis, it also reveals that algorithmic logics are radically changing the production and consumption of media and reporting and shaping the narratives by which we understand the climate emergency. So we made the work um, as this kind of algorithmic performance for a, a festival in the Netherlands last year. And when the botnet's active, it sort of performs its activities on a Zoom call. <laughs> so audiences could, can kind of, could kind of join the Zoom call and sort of commune or observe the bots going about their business um, with these sort of hundreds of accounts of, scroll. Um, that were being controlled. Scroll, click, systems. click, scroll, click. Scroll, click, scroll, click, scroll, click, click, scroll, scroll, click, click, scroll, click, scroll, 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 scroll. So we had um, friends and volunteers donate their voices to each box. So they were all um, sort of animated using music. Scroll, 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 sc
plant plant meat. Meat. Okay, and so it, it continued on for like a whole week of, of this sort of uncanny Zoom call. I guess, you know, we really started thinking about Zoom as a, as a potential place for artistic intervention after, um, after pandemic, um, through, you know, after two years of pandemic times. <laughs> Um, okay, so the work also, you know, is accompanied by this dashboard showing its activities. And so in running the botnet for two weeks, it visited over 2 million sites and clicked on over 6 million ads. Um, so the, you know, the media is a crucial space for translating scientific findings, uh, holding corporate and government actors accountable and for producing political pressure. Um, and in these capacities, the media is therefore a critical space for determining the future state of our atmosphere. And, you know, the fossil fuel industry has known this for a long time. So armed with lobbyists and enjoying support from like media mongols like uh, Rupert Murdoch, the fossil fuel industry has worked to control the climate narrative. They know that whoever controls the media cycle has an outsized capacity to control the carbon cycle. Um, and so media manipulation strategies backed by the fossil fuel industry are well documented. And there's been a few recent books out like um, by Michael Mann, for example, that, that sort of documents some of these techniques like um, promoting um, stories that sort of promote inaction, like it's too late to do anything, uh, framing emissions reductions as an individual problem rather than something that um, needs to be addressed in an industry level, um, you know, sharing misinformation and so on. And there's the sort of famous story of the BP marketing team in 2004 inventing the carbon footprint calculator that frames the climate um, crisis is on this sort of individual, at an individual level. Um, and so, you know, this is a provocation to see media as a form of climate engineering or a potential for, a place for climate engineering, a place where narrative becomes ecology. Um, computational media not only influences how the climate emergencies understood, of course, um, but it also quite literally contributes to emissions and electricity demand. So heavy media like streaming, virtual reality, the metaverse, NFTs, <laughs> um, the whole bingo card of the, the sort of things that people are excited about in new media at the moment. Um, these are all like very heavy computational processes that contribute to growing energy demands and are manifestations of the trajectory towards this expectation of ongoing growth in computation, right? So from the very inception of this field of computer science, you know, there's been these foundational ideas like the Turing machine with its infinite roll of tape that produces this imagination for computing being infinite, right? It's at the very, the very beginning of the field, there's this infinite roll of tape. Um, you know, imaginaries for personal computing also emerged in the 1970s around the time of the national oil crisis at a moment where like planetary limits were really coming into, you know, public consciousness, right? Um, and this is the decade where computing was really becoming personal and taking a format that's more familiar to us today. So there's this idea that, you know, computing is a response to trying to overcome planetary limits. And so the final work I'll just quickly speed through today because I know we're really at time. Uh, is called Solar Protocol and it's examined and is a response to this, this question of like what could computing look like and what could media look like if it was taking planetary limits seriously, like what might low carbon culture look like? It's a collaboration also with um, a couple of people I am here with at NYU, Benedetta Piantella and Alex Nathanson and a whole host of volunteers around the world. So Solar Protocol takes the form of a network of solar powered servers um, that are all positioned and hosted, stewarded by different people around the world. And each of the web servers can direct the traffic in the network depending on whichever server has the most sunshine or is, is generating the most solar energy. And so when you visit solarprotocol.net, your web traffic is sent to whichever servers in the most sunshine at the time um, as a way of also exploring, yeah, like, automation by, by the environment rather than by sort of machine learning. So, so the solar servers look something like this. We were super inspired and this kind of work was catalyzed by the low tech magazine, Solar Powered website that they published around 2018, I think it was. Um, so we started messing around with these servers. Um, and in building this network, you know, we have sort of built relationships with lots of people around the world. Um, each is set up at a different time zone and a different weather system, which obviously also 
determines how the logic of the network operates. Um, here are some of our stewards. <laughs> um, I'm not going to play the videos, but um, yes, they, they're really, we depend on them to sort of do this work. Um, and we really aim to have sort of a uh, service set up across as many time zones as we could around the world. So obviously that's going to make the network more robust um, as the sun moves across the, the planet or the planet moves across the sun. Or, you know. um, anyway, the network works by reconfiguring the domain network, uh, the, the, the domain name protocol, the DNS protocol, domain network um, protocol. And so DNS is a decentralized system that associates URL address with IP address. So like the name you type into your browser with the, the IP address of the server. So it's essentially telling your computer where to send its request, right? Based on, based on IP address. And so for large scale, high volume web services, um, the, the DNS protocol will typically send network traffic to where, whichever server gives it the closest response time. So for example, if you make a Google search, your request probably sent to a Google data center nearby. Um, and so this prioritizes speed over other factors that determine how a network operates. Again, this is a characteristic that, you know, is very familiar in digital culture, but it doesn't have to work this way. And so Solar Protocol is built with this logic of the sun based on the sun. Each server checks in to see if they're in, in the most sun at the time, and then they become the active server in the network. So they sort of take over the DNS of the network and, and requests are sent to their IP address. Um, and so this changes throughout the day. You know, it's been winter here in New York, so our servers here have not been the active server very much. Um, but this also means that we're deciding where to move computational activity in the network based on where there's the most naturally available energy rather than what would produce quickest results for the user. So it sort of moves beyond this idea of like user centeredness. Um, and so in other words, Solar Protocol uses the distribution of sun to determine the DNS and the, the way that network traffic's directed. And so coming back to this question of intelligence and AI, you know, if intelligence is this capacity to sort of like synthesize a logic and apply that logic to make decisions, then the question is, you know, what can we recognize as logic? What do we, what do we recognize as logic? And therefore, you know, what, how, what logics can we use to and apply as intelligence? You know, we, again, we hear a lot about machine learning and logics from data, but what if we use the planetary limits as logics? What if we use them to automate decisions in our infrastructures? Um, how could we learn or relearn to design with forms of intelligence that are neither artificial nor human, but come from the environment, emerge from the environment? And what would automation look like in this, you know, in this way? Um, so of course the term natural, so we've been talking about this as a sort of form of natural intelligence. You know, understanding that the term natural is difficult. It's not a, you know, attempt to sort of separate the human out from everything else, nor do we use it to sort of like falsely disguise or hide political questions of automation. But we use it sort of as a provocation to disturb um, the dualism that's implied by the, this word artificial and artificial intelligence that sort of hides the, the labor behind it, the role of the human, environmental extraction that's all, all necessary um, in, in AI. And so this graphic you see shows the logic of the network. The colored lines, are each sort of ring is a server. The yellow shows its solar energy production across time. Um, the, the graphic shows 72 hours of activity and those colored lines show that when that server was the active server. So you can see that it's kind of jumping around. The website looks like this. You know, we did a lot of thinking about our design. We don't use JavaScript. The graphics are all generated server side because then we know they're generated by, by solar rather than kind of having the user generate them in their browser where they might be generated by fossil fuel energy or who knows. Um, we also kind of took notes from the low tech magazine and tried to reduce the size of our website, reduce the size of our um, assets and not use energy tracking, not use energy intensive tracking technologies. So right, like I think there's also an interesting political possibility here of a solar powered or low, low carbon internet 
would kind of disincentivize the use of surveillance or data-driven practices. Um, just running through these, so each server steward can also host their own website on their server. So we're hosting one for the Extinction Rebellion Solar Punk Storytelling Contest. And one of our stewards is Ann Pasek, who runs a low carbon research methods group. And so obviously this is also an experiment in kind of low carbon way of working. Exploring this question of what does low carbon culture look like? Um, finally, my last slide. Um, the project is obviously also exploring like decision making by a protocol rather than say by a modeling or simulation like we saw in the Asunda work. Uh, and I've been very interested in this idea of protocol as a means of environmental governance or environmental management. Very inspired by the work of um, ecologist Robin Wall Kimmerer who looks at plant ecology. She's also uh, an American indigenous um, plant ecologist. So she writes a lot about indigenous protocols as environmental management strategies, right? And a particular one she writes about is called The Honorable Harvest, um, which is a guide, which guides the manner in which we take from the living world. So it defines protocols for asking permission, evaluating impact, taking what you need, using appropriate technology, demonstrating respect and reciprocating the gifts. So this idea of a reciprocal nature, a reciprocal relationship with the environment. And so this honorable harvest, you know, ha has a whole set of rules, like you never take the first plant that you see, or you never take more than half of uh, a number of plants in a region. And so it's actually a deceptively sophisticated species management protocol, ensuring that you're never going to like over extract plants from your bioregion. And so I think this idea of protocol is a very interesting way of, and uh, way of sort of yeah, environmental governance at scale, right? That doesn't rely on super heavy computing or like having to make an exact simulation of the world in order to know how to make decisions better, which is kind of the current imagination for, you know, planetary computing. Okay, I'm sure I'm over time. I kind of lost track of my time, so I'll wrap up there. But um, thank you very much. Um, I hope that was uh, useful. Um, Yes, thank you very much, Sarah. Yeah, no, you, you were uh, in time and it was really interesting and, and inspiring. And this uh, final quote, really beautiful and appropriate. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much for your, for your talk. Um, I think there are no questions uh, from the audience uh, in the YouTube chat, but I don't know if we, we have some time if uh, any of, of the projects or speakers uh, want to comment or ask any question before we finish. And if not, well, it has been really inspiring. I think we have uh, listened to a really nice constellation of projects, ideas, or related to this idea of, of sentient media, medio sentientes. And well, I think they have in, all in, in common that they are trying to bring um, a critical perspective on the technologies of sensing and, and technologies of representing and trying to, to be more inclusive, to bring other perspectives and, and perspectives and points of view that are, are often uh, not taken, taken into account. Uh, hack technologies, all these, these ideas are like uh, in, uh, a common uh, uh, ground in all the projects and ideas that we do have been showing. So I think we have a promising conversation and a uh, very uh, uh, intensive and exciting uh, prototype, uh, pro um, collaborative prototyping workshop. Uh, so I think if there are no more comments, we can 
we can finish just to to remind to all of you uh, who are listening to the to the webinar uh, that the workshop will take place from the 21st of april to the 4th of may and the um, that the open uh, the open call uh, for collaborators is uh, it, uh, the deadline is the 3rd of april so until this day you can apply and select any of the projects who will be part of the teams that we will be uh, developing them during the workshop. And then uh, just uh, to remind that tomorrow we will have the other session of the webinar. Uh, we will be starting at uh, 5 p.m. Uh, Central Europe time. And we will listen to the other four projects and other very interested, uh, interesting uh, invited speakers. So, uh, Goodbye and thank you very much uh, for all the presentations and also for the people. Uh, thank you to the people that have been listening and we, we hope to see you soon.